This documentary is about the war of independence in Ireland in 1921, uh, with a specific emphasis on the happenings in Lewisburg and surrounding areas. We'll start at uh, the area between Drummond and Lewisburg at the Maum. Uh, so we're standing here on the Maum, which is the divisional area between Drummond, which is on this side of us, and Lewisburg, which is on this side. And going back to 1920 and 21, uh, there were separate divisions of the Mayo, West Mayo flying columns. There was Drummond had its own area and Lewisburg had its own area. But uh, in the latter part of 1920, both were amalgamated uh, and uh, that was under the command of PJ Kelly. Uh, that was also, um, McLaughlin was uh, from Upde. He was the commander uh, of the Drummond area. Now he had got arrested uh, and was incarcerated during the uh, early part of 1921 and he spent most of the rest of, his, uh, of the year in jail in Galway. Now this area of course here blended itself to the style that was decided at the time by Michael Collins uh, sometime earlier on which was uh, a kind of hit and run idea because they would hit crown forces pretty hard and then retreat off to the wilds of Connemara or to the hills around even even these areas because as you can see even now it's very sparsely populated you have woodlands and you have high hills where you have a vantage point of uh, crown forces coming to uh, engage with them or, or, or try and incarcerate them um, it, they, they had great difficulty in doing so and it was a very successful um, campaign in that regard now uh, in March in 1921 there was an ambush uh, of uh, Crown forces who were moving between there was at that time there was a uh, Drummond had a barracks an RIC barracks now the RIC at that time were kind of equivalent to what the Garda Shikona are today the only difficulty was that they were working for the Crown forces and uh, they were also by and large part of Irish people who had joined up uh, you know, Ireland at the time was very poor, so it was a regular job with a good income, pensionable income, and I suppose it was very tempting to people, but as the war had m moved on, they were considered by the volunteers to be the enemy of the proposed new state. So they oftentimes became the victims, uh, because later down that barracks in Drummond was burned down. But during the ambush, which was commanded by Michael Kilroy from Newport, uh, a Sergeant Cochlan uh, was killed, and later on, the following day, uh, the reprisal started by the Black and Tans uh, in Westport Town, where several houses were burned, and people were intimidated, uh, which was the usual style at the time. If there was an ambush the following day, the volunteers would head off to the hills, but uh, their families were still in houses around the place and oftentimes they were intimidated by the forces of the Crown, uh, which this meant that the innocents were often beaten up and mauled and some of their stock may be shot and at some stages even their houses were burned down. So uh, the beauty of this landscape here, it kind of, uh, it hides a certain amount of the tragedies that happened during those periods. Uh, but it did have its advantages. And later on, we are going to Lewisburg, where we can outline further details of happenings that happened there. Up there on Colonial Hill, they sit on their thrones and drink their fill. Their fill of self-righteous, narcissistic drops in colonial bars with colonial props. Now and again they glance down at the locals over gaudy long noses and colonial vocals. I say, oh boy, we really should teach them some more. Oh, oh darling, it would be no use. Stop, stop being such, such a bore. Up there on Colonial Hill, there's a sense of great achievement with lofty ideals on political wheels and no sense of the other's bereavement. Up there on Colonial Hill, they live 
on a world of their own, pretentiously presiding over what they have killed, still gnawing the colonial bone. Uh, we're here in Church Street in Lewisburg and uh, this, uh, when I was growing up, there was a bicycle garage there which was owned by a man called Tom O'Toole and Tom uh, and his two brothers were volunteers uh, in 1920, 21, as was my father and his two brothers, uh, Patrick and Tommy. Uh, but while they at time to time mentioned some stories uh, relating to that period. Tom O'Toole was the expert and he was uh, a natural born storyteller. So he was able to tell us stories there on wet days while he was fixing punctures or whatever uh, about historical events that happened and acts of extreme heroism uh, and where uh, people involved were forced to head to the hills of Connemara to avoid the Crown forces after escapades that they were involved in. And uh, people like Tom, and I have very fond memories of uh, people like Tom, and we should always remember those people for what they were involved in, for uh, they brought us Ireland as it is today, and the peace and freedom that we take for granted. And I think that, uh, you know, in the old saying, had they died by Pierce's side, or fought with Cahalbrua, their names we would keep where the Fenians sleep beneath the shroud of the foggy dew. But the angels fell, or the litty swell rang out in the foggy dew. We are here in the village of Ascalon, which is about two miles west of the town or village of Lewisburg. And an incident occurred here on the 11th of May 1921 when some volunteers who had been lodging in a derelict house here while they were on their own. And uh, a decision was made to head west out from here. Uh, there were seven uh, men involved. Uh, there was, um, uh, included John P. Salmon, Joe Fergus, James Salmon, Martin O'Reilly, Thomas Salmon, and Patrick McNamara. Now, they decided to move out across this terrain here which is heading towards Duck McKeown. But uh, at the time there was a problem relating to uh, spies and they had been spied on obviously because they were set upon by uh, Crown forces. And they, f they defended themselves in the best way they could, but as you can see, this is open terrain. So there were very few places they could lodge behind in, in defense of themselves. And they were up against a far, far superior force. They were very limited in the ammunition that they had and uh, while two of them got injured and the rest decided at a certain stage that it was pointless to keep trying and keep going, uh, four of them escaped uh, but three of them were, um, were captured and the three men captured were James Salmon, uh, Joe Fergus and Thomas Salmon and the men that escaped were Dan Salmon, John P. Salmon, Martin O'Reilly and Pat McNamara. Oh, most of those salmons were from Caramore, uh, which is just outside the edge of Lewisburg as well too. Uh, they were incarcerated and like many more, uh, they were brought to jail in Galway, where they suffered uh, quite considerably uh, with beatings and so forth. Uh, and that was one of the, uh, the more known about instances, as was written by Dan Salmon, who was the commander of that particular force. Uh, now this area, in comparison to where the area we visited in Drummond, was not as appeased towards um, being found, because obviously if you're going to run across terrain like this, it's quite easy to be spotted, and it's quite a distance to get to any of the hills around here, although further out uh, is Leenan, Connemara, all that area. So now we leave Ascalon, uh, just outside Lewisburg, and we're heading to Kilmina and welcome to Nakabola Bridge in Kilmina, uh, where we're here to find out something about an incident that happened here a hundred years ago, uh, where the, an, an ambush occurred on the 19th of May, uh, 1921. So it's a hundred years this month that it happened. It's a misty day, 
but uh, we're going to go ahead. It's the west of Ireland, so uh, on my left here is uh, Charlie Keating. Charlie is a local balladeer and songwriter and historian. And on my right here is Seamus Hamilton, and he uh, was part of the local committee here that was involved in ceremonies that happened here quite recently. So we're about to explore really what happened on that day uh, when a group of volunteers challenged, well, what was in the might of the British Army uh, in terms of a convoy that was travelling, as I understand it, from uh, Westport to Newport. But uh, at the time, Seamus, I think they didn't fully understand, the volunteers didn't really understand whether it was going to be coming from Westport that's or Newport. That's true, uh, Liam. Uh, they weren't sure which direction they were coming from. So they had outlooks, out, uh, outposts up there on the hills, looking into Westport, and another one up here on the hill here on their left, looking towards Newport. Now these men were lying in wait here since early in the morning, maybe at five or six o'clock in the morning. So by the time that these British forces came, it was roughly around three o'clock in the afternoon. So the men were lying in wait all those hours. They were tired, wet, possibly hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a bit switched off at the time because uh, of the circumstances of rain. So some of them had actually gone down to Cummins' house here for a bit to eat and all of a sudden a shout went out. The tans were coming, right. dropped everything and took up their positions then at that stage. Yes, but w one of the lorries got through Correct, yes. uh, ahead of them, which is just passing on the bridge where we're standing and here this, now. That's right, yeah. And uh, so when they started to fire on the second lorry, this uh, uh, original lorry that, that had gone down here, they were able to swing around. The, the they had a machine gun on board yeah, yeah. and the men were standing in between the two up uh, at the back of a, a fence or a hedge. So their cover was very light at that stage because the uh, Black and Tans and RIC were able to fire at them from both directions. Is that reasonably accurate, that is, Seamus? That's the most accurate uh, description we've got at the moment. Uh, they were, they, they were, oh, their open flank was fired on and they were caught from both sides. So that's when they were in a, a die-hard a die situation at that stage. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that amounted then that there was fatalities uh, uh, among the volunteers. Yes. Severe uh, uh, um, fatalities and many injuries as well. A lot of injuries. Three men lost their lives up there. They were anointed by the local priest here in, in Clemina, who was Father Welch, and Father Killing, who was the PP in Newport. They just happened to be having a meeting up here in the parochial house the same day. Right. So they, they anointed the three dead men that was on the hill while the, the battle was raging at the same time. Okay. Uh, and there was some mention of a, a convoy of nuns or a nun uh, passing, but they had nothing to do with any of that. They were just innocent passers. Well, that's correct. Uh, early in the morning, these uh, lookouts on this hill up here saw a car coming from the Newport direction. Uh -huh. And uh, at that time, there wasn't so many vehicles on the road, but uh, there was a, a car full of nuns that was coming from Morani in the Newport area to a funeral of a, a, of a sister in Westport who had died. Right. So. Uh, they had a lucky escape because they could have been fired on and taken uh, uh, by mistake right. on that occasion. Yeah. Well, I also understand that the ones that was up near the parish priest's house, uh, that they were able to use the house as um, a safe, safe place for them to, to, to fire from as well. They did because there was a bridge up there, a railway bridge up there where the train goes from Westport to Ackill. Correct. And they took up a firing position on that bridge up there right beside the parochial house and laid fire on the men up there on those hills. That's exactly what happened in yeah, India. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're uh, standing here at a monument that was erected to commemorate uh, the ambush here in Kilmina in uh, May of 1921. Uh, could you tell me, Seamus, uh, when was this uh, erected? It was erected in 1971, it was. Now, the names of people that were involved in that are also uh, inscribed into the monument. Yes, they are. Uh, that's a recent addition that's done here. We've right. done it for the 100 year anniversary. Yes, uh, which was celebrated just a few, a few days ago, really. Just a few days ago. But a lot of these lads know they were involved in this, Charlie. What kind of experience did they have as regards? They wouldn't uh, have had, you know, some of them would have been members of Nathena. I'm just talking for the members from Westport, like, would have been, have been members of Nathena. Yes. That was the, uh, the, the uh, Boy Scouts. 
right. uh, the Republican Boy Scouts. But the type of uh, uh, ammunition that they had like, was nothing in comparison to no, what the, it the convoys they, had. They, they, th th that was the big mistake that was made. They yeah. were using a, a lot of shotguns, a lot of sort of 45s, heavy yeah. sort of revolver type guns. Very few rifles. Yes. And the man that really could use the rifle was, was of course, was Michael Kilroy. Right. Lucky enough. Yeah. But um, no, he did manage to escape that day. They did. They managed seemingly. And it went off to Skerda, was it? Yeah, or down below Newport. Seemingly, they took the wounded over towards Fahey, didn't over they? Over towards Ahagola, yeah. 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 Over that way, and they they, 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 they patched them up. Right. Well, judging by the distance here now, Charlie, for where we're standing here on Nakabola Bridge, up to where the volunteers were up behind that hedge in the distance right. there. The type of ammunition they had would have been pretty useless to fire on an army yeah. contingent here. Exactly. You know, so they were lucky to get away with their lives, the ones they that were, did. They were, they, were, they were lucky. There wasn't a lot more for tanks. But one of the things that did happen, though, was that uh, the commander, Michael Kilroy, learned a lesson. He did, yeah. So when it came to Cali Kennedy, they were much better. And that was only a month. A month later, yeah. yeah. The green flag round me, boys, to die were far more sweet. With Aaron's noble emblem, boys, to be my winding sheet. In life, I love to see it wave and fall. Now, we're out here at the community centre here in Kushla, and in, uh, on the 2nd of June 1921, an ambush occurred here. We had earlier been down in Kilmina, uh, where there were fatalities on the volunteer side, but uh, the roles were reversed in this situation because uh, Michael Kilroy had learned a few lessons from Kilmina. Uh, and they had picked a better spot. Now, Charlie Keating is here with me, and Charlie can explain maybe in more detail how this occurred and where it occurred. Kilroy and his units were were were, uh, were positioned here, right beside, just on the and side. And up the hill at the back. Here we had the um, you had the Westport Gate here, and you had the Newport one just down there, almost where the where I'll show you where the first truck came into came under fire yes and then over this side the uh, the, 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 the lads from Lewisburg and Drummond Lewisburg and Drummond and, and the Canvey yeah and down way right down there just beyond the bridge you had Joe Ring was another compliment to me okay now as it happened that particular day there was what the IRA were doing at the time were the volunteers they used to dig the roads yes they used to dig a trench across trench <coughs> the roads they call it and there was a trench in this area and yeah. uh, that's to stop the convoy yeah, passing stop the convoy and uh, the, the uh, 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 two Crosley tenders and a Ford uh, car came out of Westport yes uh, under heading uh, towards Lena. heading towards Lena. it was a complement of a 20 Men. Personnel, yeah. That was a uh, mixture of RIC yeah, well, and black and tans. RIC, black and tans, and the head DI was uh, Stevens, Edward right. Stevens. He was um, a district inspector. Um, he would have held a fairly high rank in, in, in the army, so he was auxiliary, really, okay. material. So he, he, uh, he was the. They were a great up now from the black and tans. They were a grade up. They were uh, they were officer class. Yes. Um, the black and tans were your ordinary soldiers. Correct. Uh, most of them were. And they were called that because of the colour of their uniforms. Th that exactly. You, you, you uh, they were they were probably oftentimes soldiers that fought in the First World War that were kind of redundant. They were all ex army, as we said. They had seen, they had seen the horrors of the First World War and yes. had taken part in them Correct. in parts of France, Belgium. Holland and, and Germany, like so, like they, they were hardened they, up. They were hardened. They 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 were soldiers, and the RIC were the ordinary people, which would be equivalent to our police force at the time. But they were an armed force. Right. But anyway, this this convoy had left Westport. This convoy. It was heading to Lena, yeah. but the bridge was blown. So what happened was, the convoy came out here. The path. 
the boys were still in position. Yeah. They went out as far as the bridge. Right. As Erif. The bridge was blown, so they had to turn back. So they turned back and they stopped at Derby Hastings pub. That'd be the half. The halfway today, yeah. For some refreshments. Yes. Right? So they had finished there. So they went on their way. Now they what they were had they were going out to uh, uh, bring uh, or to question to uh, volunteers that had been out there or known suspects. Yes. Uh, to bring them into the barracks to right. interrogate, interrogate them. them. So now the, the it, it was unusual the the, 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 the formation. Uh, formation because really the first tr uh, Crosley tender and then behind that maybe. 500 yards came the second Crosby Right. And behind that then, right behind it, directly behind it, came the Ford uh, camp. And would that normally be in, at front? That would normally be, be at front, right. or it may be in the middle. Okay. And it, it may be the district inspector would have been possibly in that. Ah. Uh -huh. Whereas he had been riding shotgun right. in the front on the first yeah. Crosley tent. So they came this way, passed up, now almost where the monument was, Okay. that's when the fire stopped. Yeah. That stopped, they were, they were engaged there. Yeah. The next one pulled about there and behind that was the Ford car. Yes. Now their Ford car had been, had broken down so they, they commandeered okay. uh, Gus de la Hunting. He was a local uh, electrician. I remember him quite well. Yeah. A small man, nice man. Right. He was into radios and all okay, that. Okay, so good at elect electronics. Yeah. But <laughs> as when the firing started, he was quick enough. He jumped out. Right. And ran and went in under that bridge there. Oh. Uh, no, he, he wouldn't have been armed, uh, Charlie. No, no. He yeah. wasn't armed. He was just uh, he's he's vehicle. He was commandeer to drive the vehicle, drive more or less. Vehicle. He had nothing got to do with it whatsoever. Yeah. But he he just happened to be in the wrong place. Right. The really wrong. But place. he was clever enough to get himself he under a bridge. Well, <laughs> it was the safer well, place as you could be. Thing, so. <laughs> well, I know. Uh, uh, but I, this I, I, convoy was very well armed. They had it was uh, very well armed. they had a, 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 um, a lots of ammunition on board. They, they had, had uh, they bomb had, equipment. In both of them, there was, uh, as far as we know, the, in the first one there was a Lewis machine gun, and the second one, uh, it, it possibly as a consequence of s some gr grenade thrown, which they would have had grenades in their stockpile. In the yes, seemingly one of them must have been hit. Right. But this one here, the um, they found out that uh, when they went to examine it, the volunteers. Yeah. That, uh, that blew up that wagon. The uh, grenade went off. But then they tried to man the, the, the machine gun. But every time they did, they had a sh the volunteers had a sharpshooter that... That's right. Well, they, they killed they them off. Them out. The Three of them, Flaherty I think. eventually got his hands on the Lewis gun. Yes. Now, that gun... That uh, changed and, the whole uh, thing. It, 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 so what happened then was um, some of the, uh, the, the uh, black and tans retired into the widow's Widow McGrail's house. Yes, which was, was just kids close there, by here. Down yeah. there. And uh, of course, um, they were fired out. Yeah. The the volunteers were reluctant to fire at them, really. Yes. They were trying to uh, persuade them to come out with their hands up yeah. and surrender. But so they were trying to get the, the, the children and the woman of the house to come right. out. So but they, they refused. And um, Michael Kilroy told them, if you if you harm these people, we will, we will annihilate you. They eventually... They eventually saw Came with the white flag. Basically, <coughs> that was. But Michael Kilroy was left in an awkward situation then, because a lot of the people that were there, because of some of the reprises that had happened around this area in particular, they had houses burned down, they had all kinds of uh, livestock killed and all of that. That his house had been burned out right, okay. only the, the day or two before that, and and his workplace, and his, workhouse, mm -hmm. uh, his workplace. Mm -hmm. So that left him in a situation that while the people were shouting at him, just mow them down. But he says, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Uh, we're actually going to help them. Once they had uh, given up, uh, he decided that uh, it was going to be f fairly done. Uh, uh, now, while they did, they did gain the ammunition, and they took that with them, uh, but and they headed off to the hills, more or less. Area. Great thing about this ambush really was it, it was really timed very to perfection time wise and light wise yeah right the engagements lasted 
let's say over two hours. Yeah. So you were you started half six, half seven, half eight. You were heading into nine o'clock. Okay. Ten o'clock. Towards getting dark. No, there was no no chance. They did allow one of the one of the RAC men to to to, to, to cycle back to Westport. He, he was wounded, but uh, they, they told him un, under no circumstances, you know, try to bring out yeah. reinforcements. Nice. Right. He, he he went ahead, but they. To divert and to, 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 to really draw away attention from the things, they went that direction right. and they doubled back and they came back that way towards Own Wee. Oh, right, okay. And they went on to Tear McCruick and they got safe, they had safe they had houses. houses there, yeah. You see, all those people were safe houses, they yes. were feeding them and they were putting them up. And right. you know, it was huge. As a terrible to risk to themselves. And huge, yeah. huge so that's where they went. Now, you have to take into consideration the next day, the army then come on the scene. They didn't go out that evening because the dusk, they were afraid. See, Westport was under curfew at the time. Yeah. All the towns, all the countryside was under curfew. So you couldn't be seen out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this was supposed to have been an incident like that was high up on the list of causing the truce to happen. Mm-hmm. Because they began to realise that this tide is turning against the powers that be. Uh, now, at least there was no losses on the volunteer side in this no. uh, ambush. It was all on the on the opposite side. This monument here was dedicated to the men of the West Mayo Flying Column who partook here in an ambush at Carrick Kennedy on the 2nd of June. 1921 against the British forces. But that's all we can say, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But God bless them all. Well, that's marvellous, Charlie. Thanks very much for coming out on a misty day. It was in Heron's Eye A place you all know well Where I spent Many's a happy day in Mayo's flowery dell. It's but a humble country place, but still it's dear to me. It's the idol of my wildest dreams. It's Carrickenna. Shadow of Crow Patrick's eye. This little village stands. It was here or so all brave men fought against the black and tans. In the year of nineteen and twenty one, in the merry Many a time we tell the tale of that historic noon. A mighty ambush to take place, and the tans went to the ground. All gallant flying convoys, they fought. While grass grows green on high